Are we on? We're on. Good morning and a very warm welcome to St. Matthias this morning if you're joining us here uh, or online and especially if you're joining us uh, for the first time uh, or visiting us. It's great to be able to be here together to worship. I'll just, um, we're going to start with some great praise because we're still in the Easter season, but um, I wonder, I just felt prompted, the news is not easy, is it? at all, um, especially in Israel and around that part of the world. I wonder whether we just stand for a moment and uh, just uh, bring ourselves before God just as we are, uh, whatever you are carrying that you have brought into this place. Um, Maybe also ask God to take that burden that we feel also for longing for that peace uh, and uh, no no escalation of any uh, war in the Middle East uh, as looks possible. Um, so can we just pose for a moment, uh, stand, and if you're comfortable to stand, and then we're going to uh, remind ourselves, as David did, I think, I think it was last week, I lose track of which weeks, just that Christ's resurrection brings a whole new uh, way of us looking at the world and uh, how God is at work in it uh, and is ultimately victorious because of the resurrection. So we hold a moment of quiet and ask God to move among us and to help carry our burdens for our lives and for his world. So, Lord Jesus, by your Spirit, we thank you. You're here among us, and you're at work in your world, turning hearts and lives to you, breathing light and life and hope and peace. Lord, help us all to be open to receive those things from you as we meet now in your name and offer you our praise. Because amidst the difficult news in the world, this is the good news. The grave is empty, Christ is risen. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never put it out. Hallelujah. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. church with celebration, that the world may know that your holy son Jesus is not a dead hero that we commemorate, but the living Lord that we worship, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be our praise forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing, You Are Alpha and Omega.
let's continue in worship. It's Jesus is the name we honor. If you're able to stay standing, please do. Thank you. Pizza. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes, okay. Branston. It's quite impressive, isn't it, really? Uh, how it goes. How about Cadbury's? Chocolate. Chocolate or cream egg. Yes, that's interesting. Nike. Trainers. Trainers. I've got probably down. Kellogg's, which might be Kellogg's. Cornflakes, probably, isn't it? Starbucks. Coffee. Coffee. That's right. So uh, this is an interesting one because we might get a few, but there's probably only three amongst the room, which would be Heinz. Beans, isn't it? Probably. It's, if you did it the other way around, beans means you might get something more uh, straightforward. There's something about the name that somehow represents the product. Does that make sense for you? And um, today we're going to remind ourselves about what does it mean when we say the name Jesus? What about the name of Jesus? What is it that is represented by the name of Jesus? And interestingly, what we're going to learn um, from uh, Scripture today is that throughout the New Testament, actually, we find, especially in the word in Acts, we use that people say the name of Jesus. It means far more than just the product, if you like, the one thing or, pers- or, 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 or person. It actually, so the name of Jesus does signify his person, but it's far more. It's actually, every time we read it, it's, it's representing his power and, in a sense, his very real presence. And uh, in the reading, we're going to have a bit later, um, we see how Peter demonstrates how the name of Jesus is powerful for healing and for forgiveness because, as he tells the crowd when we hear about that in a bit, 
Jesus is still alive and active. So the question that we're all invited to ask us today as we hear God's word to us is, I wonder how are you allowing the name of Jesus to still be active and alive in you and active in you and through you as we hear these readings? So um, we have a, a relatively... Uh, adult group of volunteers who have been asked to help with our reading. And uh, so um, can I introduce you to, um, I think uh, Linda is going to be our narrator. And um, I wanted just to set the scene for a moment because um, we have, in fact, I'm not quite sure how we can do this really. We have, we have a, a, a person who is just described as a, as a, a beggar who can't walk, um, who um, we are naturally needs some uh, friends to uh, help him uh, into the temple courts or just outside the temple courts in Jerusalem just to beg for money just because that's all he could do and the interesting thing about this uh, story which I hadn't quite realized it's a it's just a fortuitous or a God-given uh, design of this building. I don't know whether you can um, imagine just how high that just look up at the, the top of the arch or the, just the top of the roof here, I'm told, is, I can't remember how many metres it is, it's about 70 foot, which is about 20, 25 metres high. Now, apparently, one of the gateways into the temple, the, the, probably the gate that, that we think is called beautiful, there's two gates that people argue about which one it might be, but one of the most likely ones seems to be that was the gate beautiful, which I've got written down here, which I can't remember which I've written it down, really. I couldn't understand the Hebrew of it. Anyway, this particular gate was made of solid bronze, brass, 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 um, and the gateway was 75 feet high. So actually, if you could just imagine a huge gateway, we're, we're sort of setting the scene beautifully for how, this, how Peter and John, who are coming to pray, like all devout Jews would come to pray a couple of times a day. Um, so though they were Christians, clearly they were still obviously taking part in the temple worship to pray. And about three in the afternoon, this is the second time of prayer, and uh, they saw this disabled man and had quite a surprise for him. So um, I think, let me just check my script and then Linda can work out where we are. We've got everyone in place. So we might need to just, I think we might just need to start off getting this, this poor man can't walk and it's just... Um, if there were a lot more children here, I would have perhaps suggested I took off a shoe, but you'll be pleased, especially in the front row, that I don't do that. Um, just to, I mean, we all wear shoes. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Fantastic. So this is our lame person. So you, you can start. Please carry on. While the man held on to Peter and John... Hang on. Wrong bit. Not your fault. The last minute. There you go. Thank you. So sorry. <laughs> just stop, stop at the end of that page, Linda, please, for now. Thank you. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple <clears throat> at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Mike. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate, called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg, to <clears throat> excuse me, to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. <laughs> then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. <laughs> when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. 
Fantastic. And then, so Peter saw this man, and instead of giving him money, he saw, gave him healing by praying for him in the name of Jesus. And seeing everyone running to uh, see what had happened to this man, Peter seizes his chance to tell them all about Jesus. And so in a moment, I think Linda's got one line, and then Peter's going to carry on probably at the lectern, Peter, because that mic doesn't sound as if he's working. Thank you. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you very much for all uh, our... <laughs> Thank you, people. Ms. Sharon is going to uh, unpack that reading a, a little bit. Uh, more a bit later, but for now, it's just there was still a way back for them. God would still forgive them. If you remember Peter's words, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And astonishingly, that promise still stands for us today, doesn't it? As a we're going to come to a confession prayer, and um, I, I remembered that uh, several years ago we had a wonderful prayer activity, which I've set up here again, and if anyone uh, would like to just uh, have a go with this prayer activity, please do, uh, as part of this, as their own way of doing their confession. There is a stone uh, in, a, in that, please do. I mean, Charlotta might like to have a go at doing that. I don't know, um, Sarah, if you want to try that. Um, but um, I'll just do that, and then we'll have our confession prayer. But it's a profound thing. It's not just for children. But uh, you'll probably find if you dampen the dampen the stone first. Do you want to just come and I'll, I'll move away, Sarah, and then you can. Do that on your own. Just mind the candle, obviously. So some words on screen as a confession prayer. Some words on screen as a confession prayer. As we pause to recall where we know we need to turn back to the Lord. So let us return to the Lord our God and say to him, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins. He'll strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. God is good to 
Forgive us. Uh, Jesus is good to have gone through all that he did, more than good. Uh, we're going to sing God is good. Here we are, people of faith. It's a, it's a shaker number, so if you want to um, come and do some shakers and, and rattling and dancing, then please uh, do join in that. Do take a seat. Um, Sharon's just going to speak to us, but in the meantime, um, if for those of you who wonder whether vicars only work on Sundays, let me just prove to you this is not the case. Uh, if you wish to um, take part in the craft activity, which Claire and probably I will be supervising, there you can make the Dancing Man version A, or you can make the Dancing Man version uh, B, who was, once was lame but is now healed in the name of Jesus Christ. So uh, to help you celebrate that, uh, please uh, come and any age welcome. There's plenty of material here, um, but I don't want to stop you from listening to Sharon either. Thank Over to you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Is risen Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Now that's such good news. For the past couple of weeks since Easter Sunday, we've been confidently stating that Jesus is risen. And David's sermon last week went into all the evidence that we have to believe this. So, if Jesus is alive, surely he's going to be doing the same things now that he did when he was physically present on earth, isn't he? Or is he? Do we believe that? Do we actually believe that he is active in the world today 
the way he was, as we saw, acted out through Peter and John in the reading from Acts. Are we allowing him to live in us and be active in the world through us? Is it actually simpler to believe that he was raised to life back in the first century, ascended up into heaven, and is just sort of sitting up there somewhere, vaguely keeping an eye on things, rather than actually believing that he's active in the world today? After what we've heard so far this morning, do we actually believe that Jesus heals people today? Now, as quite a lot of you here know, I'm a GP. So for the past 30 years, I've been really privileged to be part of God's healing work in medicine. I strongly believe that he uses medicine as a vehicle through which he demonstrates his healing power, be that in gifting researchers with the intellect to find new treatments, gifting surgeons' hands with the skill to operate, or many other of us in medicine and the allied professions with the skill and compassion to empathize and relieve the suffering of those who are ill, be that physically or mentally. However, you may well ask, does a rational, scientifically trained 21st century medic believe that God heals today in the way that he did through Peter and John in Acts chapter 3? Well, the short answer to that is, yes, I do. I have seen people miraculously healed when they've been prayed for, and I've experienced healing myself. Six years ago, Paul, my husband, and I set about house hunting in Torquay. Unfortunately, I was on crutches as I'd severely sprained my ankle. We came down one weekend, and we viewed some houses on the Saturday. I was in a lot of pain. I vividly remember sobbing in the hotel room that evening because I'd taken all the pain relief that it was safe for me to take that day. And despite that, the pain was still pretty bad. On the Sunday morning, Paul dropped me off here for the service at 11 o'clock, which actually turned out to be a healing service. Now, as I said earlier, I had seen miraculous healings previously, so I did believe that, it, that God does heal. However, I personally had never asked for healing for myself for anything before. And I've also got to admit that the other thing that I'd experienced in terms of teaching and the way I'd seen healing delivered, I actually witnessed prayer for healing being done in a way that I actually thought was quite hurtful and potentially damaging sometimes. So to be honest, I was a bit dubious. However, the sermon that I heard preached here at St. Matthias that morning was, quite frankly, the most honest sermon on healing I'd ever heard. The preacher acknowledged that, yes, God heals, but not everyone and not all the time, and we honestly really don't know why that's the case. So I actually went up for, for prayer for healing after the service. Now, I'm not going to say that my ankle was suddenly made strong the way that we heard that the beggar's ankle was in verse 7. I didn't suddenly throw away my crutches and go skipping out the door, but there was a big change in my requirement for painkillers. The previous day, I'd taken the maximum that I could possibly take, and that wasn't sufficient. After prayer, I just took a couple of doses on that Sunday, and I was able to manage stairs in the property that we were viewing, partially weight-bearing on my ankle, rather than having to slide up and down the stairs on my bottom the way I had on the previous day. So yes, not only do I believe that God heals today, I've experienced the healing of physical pain by him myself. This does, however, bring me on to one of the difficulties that we sometimes encounter with miraculous healing. I'm sure there were many other people who received prayer here that day 
with far worse things than a sprained ankle, who weren't healed. And in the grand scheme of things, my ankle really wasn't that important, was it? Surely. Don't get me wrong, I was really grateful to God for healing me, but why me? Why then? And why not one of the other people who'd gone forward for healing? Why not everyone who'd gone forward for healing? My ankle was going to get better in its own time anyway, wasn't it, at some point? Because the way that God's designed our bodies means that they often do heal themselves of minor injuries and illnesses. So although it was nice not to be in so much pain, and also it did actually confirm to me that this was the right church for Paul and I to join, I've often wondered why I was so blessed that day. One thing that's become apparent over the past six years, though, is that my testimony about this is a really powerful witness to my faith in Jesus and in his healing power. Because for one thing, when I tell people about this, if they know I'm a GP, they do actually tend to believe that something happened to me that morning, that I'm not just making it up, this isn't just hysterical self-suggestion. And actually, even as soon as me getting back to work the week after I had the healing for my ankle, my colleagues were noticing that I was in a lot less pain. And that gave me an opportunity to talk to them about what had happened and to tell them about Jesus. However, as I've said before, it does feel like miraculous healing is the exception rather than the rule these days, doesn't it? We might well believe that Jesus healed people when he lived on earth in bodily form and that his early followers, like Peter and John, did so too. But I'm sure we've all prayed for healing and not perceived any response from God to our prayers. So what do we do with that? How does it make us feel? I'm going to come on to some very negative ways that we can respond to this. One thing I mentioned earlier was that I've seen healing ministry done in a way that can be quite damaging on a variety of levels. Sometimes when Christians have been praying for healing for someone and nothing apparently happens, there can be a tendency for them to blame the person for whom they were praying. When Jesus healed people, he would often say to them, your faith has made you well. So sadly, sometimes we as Christians can imply, or even worse, sometimes state explicitly, that it's lack of faith on the person that's being prayed for is the reason why they're not being healed. Now I ask you, is that a compassionate attitude to have to another human being who's made in God's image, who's asked for our prayers? I don't think so. Bearing in mind that to be seeking healing in the first place means that someone is suffering. And having the courage to acknowledge that to others makes them extremely vulnerable. So I actually think it's really quite cruel to blame someone for not being healed. It can result in making them feel unworthy, making them feel that God doesn't love them, or that he doesn't care about how much they're hurting. This blame can also work the other way around, though. People can sometimes blame those who are praying if healing hasn't occurred. Saying, well, they didn't pray hard enough. They didn't do it right. As though it's the people who are praying themselves that are the ones doing the healing. But in verses 12 and 13 of the reading this morning, Peter says, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our power or piety we'd made the man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. So it's not the people who are doing the praying that are doing the healing. It's God's Holy Spirit working through them. 
That's what's bringing the healing, not the people themselves. One way to actually safeguard against some of these problems that can arise in prayer ministry is to have two people praying for the one who's asked for prayer. That can help to prevent the abuse and misuse both ways of this ministry. After all, even in this passage, it was Peter and John, not just one of them, going it alone. So having more than one person praying provides accountability and safeguarding against abuse or even just allegations of abuse. So later on in this service, when prayer for healing is going to be available, we'll be offering this in pairs, not as individuals. I just want to come back to the fact that I really honestly don't know why God answers some prayers for healing and not others. But I do believe it's important to continue to pray for those in need who've asked for our prayers and to do so in Jesus' name. Why am I saying that? Well, John alluded to this earlier when he was talking about the power in Jesus' name, the brand image, so to speak. Jesus' name is powerful for healing and forgiveness. Jesus told his first followers to heal the sick in his name, which is exactly what Peter did in verse 6 of the reading, when he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. But what does it actually mean to pray in Jesus' name? Is it some sort of magic formula to twist God's arm and make him answer our prayers, a bit like sort of fingers crossed? No. What it means is praying for things that will glory and honor the name of Jesus, not bringing glory to us. It means to pray for the things that he desires. Nothing that we pray for should be for our glory but it should be to honor and glorify God in the sight of others. So again, Peter's answer when he was being questioned about the healing in verse 16 is that it's faith in Jesus' name that has made the beggar strong, pointing his listeners to Jesus, not to himself. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. It's a very simple prayer, isn't it? It's not flowery or convoluted, but it's simply stated and offered in faith. But as I've said, many of us have experiences of prayer for healing and not seen those prayers answered. And I guess we could say that about a lot of our prayers, really, not just those for healing. How long have we been praying for Ukraine? How long have we been pleading for Gaza? What do we do when our prayers don't seem to be answered? Do we give up praying? No. We're not alone in not getting immediate answers to our prayers. There's even an example of Jesus praying more than once in order for complete healing to be achieved. Does anyone here who studied Mark's Gospel in Lent remember the story of the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida? This is recounted in Mark chapter 8 when it says that Jesus spat on the man's eyes and laid hands on him. Jesus then asked the man, do you see anything? The man replied, well, I see people, but they look more like trees walking. So it seems that it was only a partial healing, a partial restoration of sight initially. So Jesus then went on to lay his hands on the man's eyes again. And the man opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So be encouraged Don't give up praying. Or even if you've not prayed before, why not try it? Indeed, 
this is a bit of a spoiler alert because next week we're going to be launching an initiative called Try Praying. This is taking place across the bay and there are going to be adverts on buses and there's going to be support materials for us to use and to pass on to family and friends who don't know Jesus. But as I say, that's a spoiler. There's more to follow on that next week. I'd just like to conclude this morning by saying that I really believe that God has given us his Holy Spirit to empower us to follow him to do his work, to be like him, to share in his mission to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to show his love for others and bring his compassion and saving power into their lives. We are most like Jesus when we get alongside to help and support people who are hurting, be that mentally, physically, or spiritually. John's got some good news to share about someone else who's been healed, but after that, there's going to be some prayers for healing. There's going to be an opportunity to join in prayer corporately for healing and also for people to come forward and receive individual prayer for specific needs further up behind the altar. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um. (laughs) So, yes, as uh, we... It seems uh, it would be odd if we didn't offer a chance to pray for healing today. And uh, so, as Sharon's uh, said, um, we're going to, when we've done this, bef- it's always available after all of our services anyway, but um, to try and encourage more people to come, which we thought of a different system to make it uh, possible to do that. So, we've turned the, uh, perhaps if somebody could turn the light on in the um, Francis Chapel. We're going to turn the Francis Chapel into a waiting area. It's uh, Jesus the Doctor's waiting area. And uh, there's going to be two, two pairs of people up in the chancel there, one behind there, if you'd like to just go and ask someone to pray with you. And also, if you, we offer prayer ministry in different ways. Having a couple of people there, it's helpful sometimes just to say roughly, very short, uh, briefly, why you would like or what you'd like someone to pray for you with. But sometimes you'd rather, it's just between you and the Lord. And um, you might just ask, uh, so Dallas is uh, going to uh, offer just to uh, anoint you with some oil and pray for your healing in the name of Jesus. Uh, And you don't have to say anything at all uh, to her about that. We're just between you and the Lord. So um, if we're going to, to, they're going to have one song after Sally has led us in some prayers um, and, and then carry on with that. Um, praying uh, as the rest of the service goes on but um, that's where we're going to be doing that but I did want to before Sally speaks um, it is this is so much God's timing uh, today uh, because as today we are encouraging people to seek healing from the risen Jesus only this week uh, Bob and Catherine uh, members of the church here uh, emailed me to say please could we meet this week I didn't know why at the time, to share an extraordinary story of God's healing of Bob. Uh, we can't really do the whole just account justice now, but in a nutshell, here it is, and I've checked that this is okay with them too to share. Four years ago, Bob ha- had surgery to remove a stage four cancerous kidney, only then to discover secondary inoperable tumours in his chest. Family members were uh, clearly praying for them, Uh, at that time. But out of the blue, one lunchtime, uh, Bob said I was cooking lunch, and uh, he had the most amazing experience, completely unexpected, of God's presence, of a warmth and peace which ran right through him, starting in his feet and walking right the way up through his to his head. And as a result of that, he's just experienced an amazing and complete peace throughout his illness and subsequent treatments and complications. At exactly the same moment upstairs, Catherine um, felt exactly the, a very, very similar sort of physical touch of the presence of God. A month or so later, he's, uh, after a second dose of chemotherapy, his next, he had a, a, a chest, another chest scan, and the words on the bottom of the scan said, no evidence of cancer cells. Uh, 
So we praise God, he continues uh, to be free from that all and has had this amazing sense of peace throughout. So however much we don't understand about it all, we, st- we do proclaim and believe that our God through the risen Jesus is very much in the healing business in all sorts of ways, as Sharon has uh, pointed out as well, including going to your GP uh, or whatever. But um, just to encourage you to keep praying and to come forward to pray. And um, as that man uh, in, acted out for us, needed someone else to pray for him, sometimes we might feel it's helpful to have someone pray for us. And uh, Sally's going to continue to help us pray for other people and ourselves, and, uh, and then we're going to sing and have that prayer time. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the encouraging an inspirational testimony of Bob and Catherine. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the good news of your love, faithfulness, and healing power, for the assurance that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, that your word is truth. We give you all the praise and glory and thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, our comforter. As we come now to pray for others, at the end of each section, there will be a short pause when we can name silently situations and those known to us personally. Then I will say, Lord Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. Lord Jesus Christ, as in times past, Not all the sick and suffering found their way to your side, but had to have their hands taken, or their bodies carried, or their names mentioned. So we, confident of your goodness, bring others to you, whether here in this place or elsewhere, but who seek prayer for healing from you. As in times past, You looked at the faith of friends and let peace and healing be known. We pray that you will look on our faith, even our little faith, and ask, let your kingdom come. Lord Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We bring before you those for whom pain is their greatest problem, who are remembered more for their distress than their potential. We pray particularly for people we know and the many whose names we do not know but are caught up in war in Ukraine, Gaza, Israel, Sudan, Haiti, and other conflicts in the world. We bring before you now those in this fellowship who have asked us for our prayers. We pray for Angela Burt, Tom Fish, Sarah Smith, Dawn Allenson, Andy Guy, <coughs> Robert Evans. Lord Jesus, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We bring before you those whose minds are shackled to neurosis, depression, or fears who do not know what is wrong or what to pray. Lord Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We place before you those whose experience light has turned to darkness 
as at the end of life. Or the breaking of a relationship leaves them stunned in their soul and silent in their conversation, not knowing where to turn. Lord Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. Heavenly Father, on all who tend the sick, counsel the distressed, sit with the dying, or advance medical research, we ask your blessing that in caring for your people, they may meet and serve their risen Lord. For those who administer the agencies of health and welfare, we ask your guidance and wisdom that in all they do, human worth may be valued and the service of human needs be fully resourced. All these prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, whose flesh and blood have made all God's children special. Amen. We now join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to uh, just uh, fling open the doors uh, for people to come to receive some prayer if you'd like to. We're going to uh, sit while we sing, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. So you might want to stand to sing if you're comfortable to do that. Thank you.
for the dates in the diary when you get home. Uh, the girls allowed meetings, the organ recital, some church family day out, um, youth-led service in two weeks' time in the evening as well. Do stay for coffee um, and uh, buy, if you haven't, for I think nearly 58 years. I'll wait until Anthony's, uh, or else I'll come to you, Anthony, if you want, because we can probably get the camera around onto you if you'd rather not. Thank you. So Anthony's um, been ordained a priest for 58 years nearly, I think this June. Um, and the, in order to, it's all to do with safeguarding and stuff like this. So Anthony's reached a sort of difficult decision, which is that if you want to carry on leading services in public and preaching in public as an cler- Anglican clergy person, you have to have what's called permission to officiate, which is the bishop's permission to do that. And as such, you have to jump through all sorts of training hoops and everything else. And I think Anthony's just thought, you've had enough of jumping through hoops, haven't Absolutely. you? So um, the slightly sad thing about this is that, or the confusing thing sometimes, is that actually, um, as a as a priest who is no longer licensed, you're actually able to do less up front than you are if you are not a priest at all, which is why it's a slightly difficult decision to uh, reach. But Anthony's going to carry on doing all the prayer ministry things and uh, being the normal Anthony that we love uh, to have as part of our church family and serving, but isn't now going to be officially able to uh, stand up and lead the services. So um, I wanted to, us to just pray for Anthony in this sort of new era, really, of his ministry, Uh, and uh, he's carrying on serving the Lord and serving us in the Lord's name. Uh, And we also, I just wanted to ask you to come here, because we want to thank you for serving the church as a whole, and not just here, uh, for knocking on for 58 years, which is a long time. So can we just give you a clap for saying thank you for doing that? Um, Which is, but it, he, he's still here, he's still uh, and serving, and uh, I came across a little prayer I'd like to share with you um, to pray for Anthony in this stage of his, uh, where are we? He had quite good words, which is why I'm going to use it uh, as we pray for you on the next part of your service mission uh, for the Lord. So may the God, Anthony, who rested on the seventh day to delight in his creation, hold you in his arms as you have held this work as a licensed priest and give you his grace to let go into a new freedom to serve him in new ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. So we come towards the end of our service. I said, do stay behind for coffee and more prayer. Uh, Sharon is going to lead us in an affirmation of our faith. So if you're comfortable to stand uh, to do that, and then we're going to go straight into our closing hymn, which you may not be surprised to know is Over a Thousand Tongues to Sing, My Great Redeemer's Praise. Sharon. So let us declare our faith in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. Thousand tongues to sing.
May the God who shakes heaven and earth, whom death could not contain, who lives to disturb and heal us, bless you with his power to go forth and proclaim the good news in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.